Glad to see everyone back for this afternoon in our service. Failed to mention that we also need to keep Brett and Barbara in our prayers. Brett also has COVID, and I think an email was sent out about that. I just failed to mention him this morning. Wanted to remember him this afternoon, so keep them in your prayers as well. We'll be turning your Bible this afternoon to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 26 and 27 of this particular passage. The lesson that we're going to talk about this afternoon is Christian Olympics. I thought this would be appropriate because right now the Winter Olympics are being conducted. And I know I haven't watched any of that, but they have that going on over in China and they're doing all their wintery things. I kind of like watching the Winter Olympics more than the summer because I, I like to watch them snowboard and ski. I think it's pretty cool. I wouldn't try it because I'd probably break every bone of my body. But it's good to see them doing those things. And it's interesting to watch competition and sporting events like that. And after thinking about that, I thought this would be something appropriate for us today. Because when we run our Christian Olympics, we're, we have to prepare before those Olympics start. We prepare for the race. And even after they start, you're, those who are involved in those Olympics are still in somewhat of a preparation phase. They're continuing to train, they continue to work, they're continuing to keep their body fit and ready to go at whatever time they're called to perform their task in their competition. If you would look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we'll read this and talk about the text and then we'll go further from there. 1 Corinthians 9, 26 and 27 I therefore so run, not uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul said, I'm not boxing in the air. You know, a lot of boxers, when they train, they'll shadow box, and they're beating the air. But it's not a lot of having a true competitor in front of them. They're just beating the air. But what are they doing? They're training. But Paul said, I'm not doing that at this point. But he said, I'm bringing my body into subjection so that when I preach to others, I'm not going to be a castaway. In other words, I'm putting my body under the control of Christ and His Word and doing His will so that I can go to heaven one day. That's preparing for the life in heaven. Now, when you look at the text, Paul is discussing freedom that he has in Christ in chapter 9 in general. However, he also speaks to how he tempers those freedoms by considering those to whom he is preaching. His ultimate effort is to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he'll sacrifice his own freedom to do so. And he did that on more than one occasion. We know Paul was cast into prison on more than one occasion, not for committing any crimes or for any wrongdoings, but he's cast into prison for preaching the gospel when he's told you don't preach that. But Paul said he'd rather suffer and save souls than stay safe and watch people to be lost. He then uses illustration of one who competes in games. You notice a lot of Paul's writings. I heard this growing up, and I've said it numerous times. He had to be a sports fan. Because if you look at Paul's writings over and over again, he is referring to sports. And he's talking about sports, sporting events, different types of physical games and competitions. He says they compete for a corruptible crown. What do we mean by that? Well, they had leaves woven around a vine and stuck on their head. Well, that's going to die. You think about when you cut flowers or roses. You can only keep them alive so long because you've taken their life support system away from them on that vine and the nutrients they get from the ground and from the rain. The water will only keep them so long they're going to die. It's corruptible. But Paul said that we're looking for an incorruptible crown, one that never fades away, that's reserved in heaven for us. And so Paul speaks on how he does what is necessary in order to run the race in order to get to heaven and win that crown. This means he brings his body into subjection to God's will. And by doing so, he's faithfully preparing himself to run a race to get to heaven. Well, what do we need to do? 
I want to look at a few things this afternoon and the lesson will be yours. But I want to look at some things that we need to do in order to win that crown. Because right now we're in the Christian Olympics. We're running that race. We're fighting that fight. And we have to be prepared when that time comes for us to draw our last breath and enter into eternity. Or for that time, whenever it will be, that Christ does come again. And the end of all things will be there. We must first have the proper attitude. Attitude is important when running a race. Individual who says, I can't, won't. We have to have the attitude that I can and I'm going to do it. I know there's times I used to run and used to enjoy running or jogging. I wasn't running. It was more of a jog. And the older I get, the, the slower it gets. But still, running a race or jogging, I would do that and enjoy it. But there was a time my body would start hurting and I was thinking it's time to turn back. And there were times that I did. But I still had to run. I'd only gone halfway. still had to run that other half back. So you're still going to hurt for a while. But then if you fight through that pain, and I learned this when I did jog, that the more I did it, even fighting through that pain, you hear the second win, you get that second win. The pain goes away, you feel good, and say, oh, I'm ready to go some more. You keep doing that. And you not only run, but you finish the race. Before we can run the Christian race, we have to have the right kind of attitude that we can do it and we will do it. But we must first be willing to hear the gospel with a view of obedience. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, Jesus says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken them to a wise man that built his house upon a rock. And the rains descended and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it is founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be like unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Back last year, there was a piece of property on our way into our house and the road we live on. It had been sitting vacant for about four or five years. I kept hearing a subdivision was going in there and nothing happened. They even paved the streets put the mailboxes in and everything. And it still went like another three years just sat there thinking, well, I don't guess they're going to do anything with it. Well, they started putting up houses. And I tell you the kind of workmanship they had, we had a storm come through and all it was on, on several of them was just the studs, the two by fours, the two by sixes, whatever else they used. And one of those houses just completely imploded on itself in the winds. It just fell straight down. Another house... It stayed together enough, I guess, with the nails. It just fell against the one next to it that was almost built. They didn't do a pretty good job in, uh, or a good enough job in at least framing that house out in order to keep it to stay, those two houses, because there's two at least that did that. You've got to be able to finish and run the race. You've got to be able to know that the house is going to be able to stand. And when he talks about as Christians, the house standing is us doing God's will and being faithful to Him. In Matthew 11 and 15, Jesus says, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. We know what it says, listen to it, and then do it. John 10, 27, He says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So we have to follow Jesus and what He said in His Word. We also must be willing to count the cost. Remember I mentioned about Paul. He was willing to give up freedom, even give up his life, his own health, or whatever, in order to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to save souls. He was willing at whatever cost necessary to make sure people heard about Jesus Christ and had the opportunity to go to heaven. We have to count that same cost. In Revelation 2.10, he talks about the devil shall try some of you and cast you into prison, but be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. When we're faithful and we do God's will, He's promised us that crown. But if we live like everybody else in the world and we don't do His will, we're going to lose our soul in hell. It's just that plain and simple. We must be willing to hear the Lord and do His will in our life, not our own will. John chapter 7, verse 17, He said, If any man willeth to do His will, he shall know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself 
We have to be willing to do the will of God. Look over in Micah chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we'll walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He said, the law is going to go forth. The word of the Lord is going to go. And that's what they're there to hear. They were coming to listen to the word of God, not what some man had to say, not some man's opinion, but to listen to God's word. We have to be willing to hear, to count the cost, and submit. Next, we must have the proper nutrition. A runner isn't going to get very far if he hasn't fed his body the right things. Runners need carbohydrates for their energy when they run. They need protein for their strong bones and the muscles. And they need water. Water is good for cooling your body down and for lubrication. It lubricates those joints while you're running. And you don't want to dehydrate and pass out, have a heat stroke while you're running, especially in the summertime. And runners know that. And runners prepare for that. Not just runners. Up in our area, they have a triathlon once a year. And it's always on a Sunday. I don't know why they can't do some things on a Saturday. And so where we live as a peninsula is only one way in and one way out. And just as we leave our part of the neighborhood, they'll put up signs about two weeks before. Triathlon, November, whatever. It's always the first Sunday of November. And it says it starts at 7 o'clock. Well, they swim across Lake Conroe. I don't know what part they start there, but they swim across Lake Conroe over to our side, and it's now Margaritaville. I know it's been all over the news, but it's right down there. They have their bicycles set up. Then they jump on their bicycles, and they bike all through Montgomery up 149, the National Forest. I, I think it's like 50 miles they bike or something like that. Well, if we don't get out of the neighborhood early enough, we're sitting in the line of traffic. And I have sat there before for 25 to 30 minutes. And I know the police officers up there doing it, and I get frustrated because it may be 30 or 40 seconds or 50 seconds or a minute, nothing's coming, but they see bikes coming, they won't let any of us go. I'm thinking, you can get three or four of us out so we can go. Well, we know that's going to happen. And it holds us up. That's not the point of the story. That's just kind of a sidebar. But the point of the story is these people will swim, then they jump on their bikes, and they'll ride and then they run a marathon after that. They have to endure. They have to prepare for that. So they need the proper nutrition. We need the proper nutrition in running the Christian race. We have to have the bread of life. John 6, 35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life, and he that cometh to me shall not hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. We have to have the milk and the meat of God's word. And 1 Peter 2, 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that they may grow thereby. Hebrews 5, 14 says, But strong meat belong to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised and discern both good and evil. A new Christian can handle some of the deep subjects in the Bible, like some who has been a Christian for many, many years. Some who have been Christians many, many years can't handle it because they haven't grown like they should either. But babes in Christ have to start off learning the basics. You teach them the basics. And you get into deep subjects as they grow. And as we grow, we can get into the deeper subjects and discern both good and evil. We have to have the waters of life. John 4, 13 to 14, Jesus said unto her, Whoso drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whoso drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. All these metaphors teach us to believe in Jesus Christ, to learn of his teachings as we would eat bread and meat and drink water and milk like we physically do that. We have to learn these things and learn the application we can find in God's word. We must believe that Jesus is the son of God. John 6, 29, Jesus answered and said, This is the work of God that ye believe on him whom he has sent. Thirdly, we have to have the proper training. A runner is not going to last long if he's not going to train properly. Running is a sport that has to be worked at every day. 
Many times I did run, I ran a lot, and the more I ran, the better it was. If you ever skip a few days, then kind of fall back. In order to run two miles, you have to first run one mile. In order to run one mile, you have to run a half mile. We can go all the way down to feet. When I first started the police academy, or prior to starting, the week before, I dropped something on my foot and broke one of my toes. I'd never done that before, and it was very painful. If you've ever broken a toe or any bone in your body, it's very painful. I almost considered calling the academy and saying, well, I can't do it. And I got to thinking, no, I'm going to do it anyway because I've paid my money. I have gotten prepared for this. I'm going to go through this because I want to do it. I'll just talk to them and see what they say. When we got into our PT that afternoon on the first day, he said, we're going to run a mile and a half today. I'm thinking, I'm not because <laughs> there's no way to run a mile and a half. I could hardly walk. So I told the coach that was teaching us, he said, do the best you can. But if you can't keep up and you can't keep doing what you're going to do, I'm going to kick you out. I said, I'll do the best I can. Well, fortunately, everybody in there, but other than the, well, about 10 or 12 military guys who had kept their running up and some of them were still in the reserves and still keeping the training going, they were running and chanting their cadences. And they're all running together. They're just passing everybody. And here I'm hobbling along with a couple others that were out of shape. And we were barely making around the track. But you know, after that hill and a few weeks went by running, running that mile and a half wasn't too bad. I'm thinking, I'll never be able to do that. Because we had to take the test in order to pass the academy. We had to run a mile and a half in a certain amount of time. If we didn't, we failed. And they kicked us out. Said, sorry, go back next one. You can start it all over again next time we have one. Well, that's just not a good feeling. You have to keep on enduring. And then when they told us, you're going to run three and a half miles, I'm thinking, a mm, mile and a half is good enough for me. But when they tell you, you're going to run, you're going to run. And not only running, doing the push-ups and the sit-ups and everything else, I thought I was going to die at one point. But you know, the more we did it every single day, the easier it got, the more we could do. I went from doing 10, 15 push-ups to doing 100 push-ups within a minute and a half, two minutes, because that's what they were making us do. So you can do it when you train, but you have to train. And if you don't train, you're not going to do it. So it takes proper training. We have to purge bad habits and develop good habits. That's true with anything. If you're exercising, you're not going to eat. Go and run a mile and a half and go eat a big old half sheet cake or even one big old piece of a cake. Put that stuff aside and say, I'm in training. I've got to eat healthy and do better. We have to be willing to endure pain. We have to have patience, steadfastness, and uh, discipline. It's the same true of the Christian race. We have to have self-discipline. If you look at Romans 8.13, it says, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, that means put them to death and get rid of them, you'll live. 1 Thessalonians 5.6, he says, So let us not sleep as do the rest, but let us watch and be sober. It takes endurance. When you're running or bicycling or whatever the sport is, it takes endurance. When you're playing football, baseball, basketball, we're using running because we're talking about running a race, but with any sport, you have to build up endurance. And once you build that endurance up, you can play not only that sport, but succeed in it and excel. James 5 tells us, Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is pitiful and of tender mercy. We also have to have patience. Luke 21, 19 says, In your patience possess ye your souls. Revelation 14, 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints, that they keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. The patience that we are to have is to keep His commandments and do His will. We also must be penitent of our sins and change. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30, Paul wrote, that at the time of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. He's commanding people to repent, not stay in their sins. But next, we must have the proper attire. A runner won't last very long without the proper attire. He needs good clothing, good shoes. Now, once I started the academy, the teacher said, oh, you get about 200 miles on your shoes of running. We're going to get that in this academy, throw your shoes away. They're no good anymore. Well, I got through the academy, and those shoes still look pretty good. But it's kind of like an old racehorse. When an old racehorse gets past his usefulness, you don't just shoot him. You just send him off to pasture, let him retire and eat his grass and hay and 
Maybe ride them a little bit, but slow them down some. Well, I didn't throw my shoes away because they still look too good. So I kept them. I meant I'd run in them, but I was going to wear them around somewhere. But I paid money for them. They still look fairly new. <laughs> so, but you have to have the proper attire. You need the proper attire to begin the Christian race. In Revelation 7, 14, we can read, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Galatians 3.27 says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. A person who through his or her faith believes that Jesus is the Son of God and changes in repentance must make the good confession that I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and upon that confession one is baptized into Christ to put on Christ. You don't put on Christ prior to baptism. You put on Christ after baptism. And how do we get into Christ? Is baptized into Christ. And when we put on Christ, our sins are washed away through His precious blood that was shed on Calvary. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what we must follow. So as we close this afternoon, what do we have to do to run this Christian race? Just to reiterate what we've been talking about, we have to have a proper attitude with a view toward obedience. We have to take the proper nutrition, believe in Jesus and his teaching, and follow him. We must engage in the proper tra training, repent of our sins, and change our lives. And finally, we must wear the proper attire. We must put on Christ in baptism. Through our faith, repentance, confession, we're baptized into Christ to be saved, to be added to his church, and to begin running a Christian race. And then we, as we begin running that Christian race, we do so with patience and endurance, overcoming the things of this world so that heaven can be our home when this life is over. As one of God's children, if you've wandered away, maybe not living the life that you should be living, not faithfully running that race, you've sidetracked, stopped the race, gone off somewhere else instead of running the course like we're to run it. It's a very narrow course because the Bible tells us in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, there's a broad way that leads to destruction and a narrow way that leads to life. That narrow way is the racetrack that we're running, and it is a narrow track. We have to stay on that track and not deviate from it. If you've done that, you need to come back and repent. If you've not obeyed the gospel, come and obey Jesus Christ so you can begin running that race to prepare yourself for heaven so that heaven can be your home when this life is over. If you are subject in any way, we urge you to come right now. Why together stand and why we sing?